Hello again, I'm Logan Carswell, owner of Defined Auto Works. Sitting next to me here is the latest four-wheeler I recently got uh, done putting together for a customer over in California. I'm in Ohio, so this is going on a pretty far journey. Um, you've seen other videos in the past. I have my personal four-wheeler and my race car that I assembled. Uh, that was over seven years ago. And you've also probably more recently seen the twin turbo, uh, 1400 horsepower four-wheeler being assembled. A lot of you guys were upset that I didn't fire it up, but you know, when I build these engines, I don't always get to uh, do the final install and, and running. So sometimes I build them, ship them, and never hear back. But uh, this latest one is a little more advanced uh, as far as, I guess, technology goes with the cooling system than previous designs. So there's a lot that goes into these forwarder engines. And I've always told you that I was going to sit and kind of explain step by step on uh, how they're really assembled and some of the different components and parts that go into building one of these. Somebody who's not exactly well versed uh, with rotor engines especially is going to be a little confused when it comes to the four rotor engine. So a brief history on four rotors. Four rotor engines were never sold to the public. Um, let's just get that out of the way first and foremost. The only way you could get a four rotor is if you're a factory backed Mazda race team and Mazda made race only four rotors. So they produced those for the GTO RX-7 and IMSA class. They had the 767B, the 787B being the most famous and the last four-wheeler uh, generation. Uh, well, beyond that would be the RX-7092P. Uh, the RX-7092P was basically the identical motor to the 787B, except they detuned it ever so slightly. So those motors, uh, especially the later series, had triple spark plugs, and every single part inside of it was not shared with any production Mazda rotary engine. The rotors were much lighter, the eccentric shaft was custom, the side housings had custom dowel pin locations that allowed triple spark plugs to be utilized a little easier. Uh, they bolted from the front and the rear and met in the center intermediate housing. Um, a whole bunch of custom stuff. Even the front housing actually incorporated a dry sump built into it that was chain driven. So the, the race Mazda 4 rotors are something that everybody would dream of having but nobody really can own. So, I've always strived my hardest on emulating their technologies into production-based motors like this. So when you build a four-rotor, an order one from me, or anywhere else, you're dealing with some 13B production parts, and then we're adapting those, we're custom machining them, and uh, doing a lot of tight tolerances and experimental work uh, sometimes to bring you a four-rotor. So the biggest thing is that you're using um, uh, 13B rotor housings, you're using 13B front and rear plate and 13B intermediate housings. Uh, even if you're doing billet like this one, they're still based off of a 13B and the architecture and how everything bolts on. The biggest glaring problem with a four rotor engine, and this is only for certain applications that it's a problem, but coolant comes in from the front and then travels all the way down uh, the driver's side here in the United States driver's side makes a turn and comes back up the other side and out the water pump exit. So as you can imagine, the front rotor is extremely cold, second rotor is just barely warm, third rotor is very hot, and the fourth rotor is like evaporating water hot. So uh, there's a lot of methods to try to correct that. I, through playing with the three rotor, which also has heat issues on the very you know rear two rotors, um, have developed more technologies to cool these down. My personal race car was using a log that came off the water pump here, branched down and had feeds, external feeds, going to uh, rotor housing uh, two, three, and four. Now there's a lot of internal work that went with that, like just getting the water there is the first step, but also reworking how the water flows internally is very important. Uh, but it's a lot of work and there's a lot of lines. Mazda, uh, they fed it directly to the center housing here. so. It's a lot simpler, it's more unified to do it that way. Um, a lot less cooling modifications to the surface of the rotor housings themselves are required when you do it that way. So this one, I carefully modified the water pump. Um, I'll show the camera here, a little closer views. But the inlet is standard, just enlarged. This is one and three quarter inlet compared to the one and a half. Comes up through the water pump. It bypasses going into the front housing completely. Uh, it actually exits out here externally and feeds right to the center housing. From the center housing, it branches out evenly to the front and the rear along the driver's side, makes a 90 degree turn, and then rejoins in the center, and then you have your outlet that comes out right here. So that's the biggest difference on this motor. Uh, it is using, uh, like I said, Bellet, Bellet side housings by PAC, PAC Racing Performance. 
um, and then I modified them extensively to be able to use the center cooling. That's not something that PAC does from the factory. Uh, this engine, other notable features aside from the central cooling is obviously it has three millimeter ceramic apex seals. Some people ask me why three millimeter. Um, three millimeter ceramic seals make more power than two millimeter ceramic seals. That's something I didn't learn until not too long ago. Um, even Mazda's 787B, the R26B motor, it also has three millimeter ceramic apex seals. And it wasn't due to technology limitations, it actually was for extra power. There's less pressure, less friction, uh, so it makes a little more power, about three to five horsepower per rotor. So you're talking on a four rotor like this, upwards of 20 horsepower difference, going from two millimeter to three millimeter. So it's definitely a worthy, um, I guess you could say speed secret that uh, I put into this engine that a lot of old timers know and hardcore racers already know. The rotor housings are brand new. They're full peripheral port and with the full peripheral you're eliminating the side ports completely. With a full peripheral port motor the side ports are completely eliminated. You can see right here these ports that are filled in there and there. These are factory intermediates and that's the factory side ports. Those are filled off completely. Since these are billet, the provisions complete, uh, the provision has been completely eliminated from these, the center here and the front. But normally there'd be ports here too. Side port there, there'd be two right here and the intermediate, and there'd be one on the rear. Now a problem uh, with the four rotor, especially when it comes to making really large power, is that the four rotor uses these small ports here, here, and here, meaning that the two center rotor housings would be not taking in nearly the same amount of airflow as the front and the rear. On the rear, you'd have a large secondary port, is what they call that, and the front, you'd have a large secondary port, and then one small port. So this one would have a large and a small, the rear would have a large and a small, but the center would have two small ports, and the other center would have two small ports. So that's always been a deficit with these engines because it's using, like I said earlier, 13B architecture, and that's just sort of how the name of the game is. With a 20B, they use a really large fat intermediate plate, and that has one small port and one large port in it. So each of the three rotors are getting a large and a small primary, secondary uh, intake port. On the four rotor, it doesn't have that luxury. Uh, a lot of guys are just shrinking down the secondaries on the rear and the front, so at least they're all perfectly even flow. And that works pretty well, especially under boost. If you're boosting it, you know, you're taking in so much more airflow with a turbocharger. Naturally aspirated with all side ports, you're gonna be pretty limited to uh, maybe on the best day of the week, 400 wheel. I'd say close to probably 350 wheel because you're, you're not getting a lot of airflow. One thing to remember with the four rotor engine, it is exactly double a two rotor engine. If I was to cut this in half, this is a two rotor engine. I mean, the rotor housings are the exact same size and dimensions. I mean, they are 13B components, 13B side housings, 13B front and rear housings. So it's a lot of 13B parts in one of these. So if you're familiar with 13B horsepower production, you can't expect a four rotor to do any more than exactly double or a 13B does. So if a turbo 13B makes 400 wheel and that's pretty acceptable, then a the turbo 20B is gonna do 800, or 26B, it's gonna do 800 wheel. Naturally aspirated, you know, getting 200 wheel out of a 13B naturally aspirated is a pretty good feat. So a 400 wheel out of a four rotor naturally aspirated is, is also gonna be a pretty good feat. Now I've personally gotten 600 wheel, uh, actually 610 rear wheel horsepower out of a four rotor, all motor. Uh, a little over 10,000 RPM. Its peak power is actually at like 9,200 RPM. So they have the ability to make lots of power. Um, and then if you turbocharge it, it's, it's astronomically more than that. So these are the uh, exhaust flanges that I've developed uh, a long time ago. I've been using on my race car for quite some time now with no problems at all. But it's a V-band conversion. So this flange bolts on and then you go to a quick release uh, V-band exhaust right here, just like so, and that's it. So this will be welded on to the turbo manifold or the header, depending on the application, and there's no more gasket. 
So being individual like this, these can actually stay bolted onto the rotor housing at all times. Even on an engine teardown, this could still be remained bolted on for the whole process. So your gasket here will never have to be reused uh, or risk uh, leaking from being unbolted and rebolted again. This can go on a hundred times and it always seals. And another benefit is there's no studs to have to slide off of here. So you gain that ability to keep your header or, or turbo manifold really close to the frame rail uh, because it just unbolts and can slide out of the way versus having to come back a solid, you know, almost an inch off these studs. This is flush. So that's a big advantage. Uh, I'm going to be releasing these to market soon. I'd like to come out with a one piece CNC machined one, but I might just go out and release these two piece deals uh, to get them on the market. So the intake induction on this full peripheral port straight into the rotor housing. This uses a quick release. I came out with these a really long time ago as well. This is a Wiggins clamp. Wiggins have been used on all kinds of things from intercooler piping, oil lines, uh, coolant lines, you name it. But it eliminates the spiral worm clamp or T-bolts or anything like that. To take it apart, just lift up on the fingers like so. And then it actually unfolds. Here you have the sealing ring. And uh, beneath that is two O-rings on each side. There's an O-ring over here and there's an O-ring over there. So once you get that in position, and then you literally just close the clamp and snap it shut, and that's it. Uh, they're very easy to use. So this intake can be removed in seconds compared to you know minutes with bolts and everything. This is the fuel rail. Fuel rail, um, I kind of do a quick release design on this too. Just one bolt here, one bolt here, uh, and it just grabs the top of the fuel rail with a half moon shape. So literally that's all there is. There's no bolts actually holding this this rail in place. The injectors do their job and uh, this makes it very easy to work on. I have Wiggins clamp on the uh, coolant feeds. So this is what I was talking about before. This is the pump feed line right here. It goes into the intermediate housing. That branches out to the rear, branches out to the front, makes 90 degree turns, meets in the center, and here's the outlet coming across. So very unique design. There's actually a block off plate right here that prevents coolant from going into the front housing like normal. Everything's external. So dry sump. This is my own uh, Defined Auto Works setup that I've done on a whole bunch of motors. We went over this uh, and some other uh, clips here, but this is the oil plate, eighth inch thick. I mean, you can see the motor sits on the ground. So you can mount this motor extremely low with no problem at all. This is as low as you're gonna get a, a, a rotary engine with a dry sump like this. This is emulating exactly the Mazda Comp system with the same style of suction tubes. And that allows this plate to be extremely thin and lightweight. Uh, dry sump is actually driven off an HTD belt. HTD is a little more resilient than the Gilmer. Gilmer with the square teeth have some issues with rocks and debris getting there, it'll derail. Uh, so these are a lot more resilient to that. Dry sump. This is a uh, SCP dry sump, one and a half inch uh, pressure and scavage. So these are the two scavage pumps that suck the oil out of the motor. This goes to a tank, comes from the tank, comes into the pressure side pump, and then this is the pressure outlet right here. So this is the other side of the motor. Uh, not a whole bunch going on here. These are the oil feeds to the stationary gears. They have to be external. There is an internal feed through the eccentric shaft, but when you're dealing with a really high RPM in a race engine like this, uh, it's best to have an external feed also, so they're getting plenty of fresh oil. Rear bell of housing, rear counterweight. <clears throat> you can see how much weight is removed because these rotors are insanely light. Uh, they're over, over a pound lighter than factory, and they're starting with the 9.7 to 1 rotors. So this, this whole slab has been sliced off. You can always tell how light the rotors really are looking at a counterweight. This is a special four rotor counterweight. It's a billet machined piece. It's a spline drive, whereas a 13B has no splines. It's a taper. So it's a little more unique having a spline drive system and that's all due to the four rotor having a lobe that slides over the rear. Um, the bolts, this has you know some very large oversized studs and a few places and then uh, traditional bolts uh, and others. So that's to save weight where I could and reduce it where we could also. 
So yeah, extremely lightweight rotors, everything's dynamically balanced. Dry sump, race bearings. Race bearings have a deeper oil groove inside of them. The larger grooves gives more hydraulic oil pressure uh, and more safety at, again, higher RPM. So a standard four rotor, if you're not using a dry sump and you just have a wet oil pump, like the factory oil pump, that factory pump was made for a 13B. It was not made for a three rotor or a four. Mazda used it on the three, um, but it's not that great. Uh, it's perfect for, you know, 7,500 RPM, but so again, eight to nine to 10, it doesn't hold up. Now on a four rotor, it especially will not hold up. You're trying to feed double the bearings of a 13B with the same small oil pump. So in my opinion, you really gotta go external dry sump of some type or a very large external wet pump that pulls from a pan underneath to fully oil one of these at any kind of real RPM. If you wanna use a stock oil pump for budget reasons, uh, you can do that, but just I would say RPM should be kept to about 7,500 uh, to be safe. So this is that four rotor engine. This is the slide throttle intake system, which may have seen in other videos on my race car. It's the same exact one. Uh, basically a full throttle, nothing in the way whatsoever. Uh, it's actually pretty linear. A lot of people complain and say that a slide throttle is undrivable. Uh, I've experienced the opposite of that. In racing my car for the past seven years, it's actually extremely uh, drivable compared to even a butterfly. But the benefit is obviously there's nothing in the way at, at wide open throttle. So you get a little more power production. And also I love how compact it is. Uh, it is a little longer than a butterfly. You know, a butterfly would you know not have this extra length front rear. But man, the thickness on it. It's so thin, so easy to set up because being CNC, the idle is exactly the same gap on each one, so you don't have to have as much time tuning individual uh, runners and stuff. This is the idle screw right here, actually. So yeah, that's the slide throttle intake system. Uh, the runners are CNC, and they're two halves welded together. It's a real nice system, and uh, like I said, it comes apart real easy, so. I'm going to be videoing uh, the entire, well, I'm going to be showing you guys the entire build process on this motor, just like I have before, but I figure I'd spend a little time explaining things. So that's the biggest thing with the cooling modifications being a central cool. This is probably one of the only four rotors around that are doing that. I've heard of other people trying, but um, this is the first one I've actually seen myself. So it's pretty exciting to see how this is going to work out. Power production, this should be, you know, 700 horsepower. At around 10,000 RPM and then depending on the intake length you could make it longer or shorter and you can shift that power band around that's the beauty of uh, these setups you can run a really long intake and shift the peak torque down low into the RPM or you can run a really really short intake and shift the peak torque up really high and you get that that peak top end power and, and it's really adjustable for different tracks and situations me personally I've really fallen in love with a long intake on my race car because it has a lot more bottom end grunt, and um, that's just more enjoyable, especially when you're not a professional driver. Um, I don't get a lot of seat time, so it's it's a little easier to drive for me. But yeah, that's the, the four-wheeler motor. I'm pretty proud of it. It's gonna to go to California. And other videos, don't forget to like and subscribe. Stay tuned.